Welcome back. My name is James at Allegian on the Select Button Forums, and this is the sixth episode of the Foxhound Rank video walkthrough. In the last episode, we finished the fear non-lethally, and we'll begin where we left off, traveling from the site of that encounter back down through the warehouse and into the forest immediately before the fight with the end. This forest features a number of branching routes, so we'll move deliberately and slowly through to build an awareness of each guard's location, his area of awareness, and his patrol route. We'll give light attention to the Svatogorny East area that formerly served as a playable map for the first Metal Gear Online, but we won't stay here long since this area is optional. Finally, we'll consider a variety of techniques to use while fighting the end, the single boss to whom you can give either the least or the most attention during a Foxhound rank walkthrough. Let's load up the last play file. Fortunately, real world distraction does not count against your time in a Foxhound rank playthrough. Wow! I last touched this in June of 2012. First, grab the spider camo earned from beating the fear non lethally. Then re-equip the suppressors on your handguns since we're back to sneaking. And then open your backpack to extract items necessary to working your way down and backwards through the warehouse. Recall now that we had detonated the warehouse food shed earlier. Most of the following strategies depend upon that condition, so make available as much rotten food as you can. Knowing the four guards' locations is important since they're placed differently than before. First, on the level right below Snake, a guard patrols near the exploded food shed. We'll call him Guard A. Another guard patrols the stairs near the exit. We'll call him Guard B. A third guard patrols the middle of the ground floor. He can see Snake up high even from the bottom floor. We'll call him Guard C. The fourth and final guard also patrols the ground floor. He is out of Snake's line of sight from this starting location. We'll call him Guard D. Now here's the first strategy. Equip the crocodile cap for aiming and a rotten food item for throwing. Toss food in front of Guard C so he won't notice Snake. Run beside the railing at the top of the stairs and throw another food item to the left of the vertical wall protrusion for Guard D. Guard C will wince and catch Guard B's attention. In the food shed, slam Guard A from behind. By now, Guard B is on his way back to his patrol. Throw food over this railing and he'll encounter it on his way. By now, Guards C and D are experiencing stomach cramps from having eaten rotten food, so you can swing over this railing to grab a suppressor with no problem. No guard who's experiencing stomach cramps will notice Snake. This is what a non-lethal run of this area can look like. Here's a riskier strategy using some of the same tools. As before, throw rotten food for guard C. Flip over the top guard rail to land midway on this flight of stairs, then take down guard A with CQC. Flip this guard rail, and land on guard D for an instant KO. Run around these crates as guard B walks to inspect guard C, and finally exit the area behind guard B's back. Now there's a lot to point out here, so let's revisit that first strategy. Throwing food at the ground level crates will do two things. First, it sets guard C on the road to stomach cramps. Second, it draws guard B away from his route. Throw a second food item at the base of the stairs to catch guard B early. Throwing food at the wall will ensure that it bounces near enough guard D to grab his attention and guard A will not hear Snake's footsteps because he's focused on food. Don't forget the time gap between the guard's first cramp and his uninterrupted status as cramped. Cramps will cancel any action that guards have started, including investigating Snake's location. Finally, famished guards have low stamina, so a simple roll will knock them out with one star. This is a brief but important window of opportunity. Now, if the feed and cramp method isn't working for you, you can work through this area using the Mark 22. As before, take out Guard C first. With a quick draw, you can also use this spot to tranquilize Guard A. 
go into first person view near the railing and stand on Snake's toes to hit guard D. And guard B controls the upper level of the exit. If you use the drop catch method, he will not see Snake's descent. However, he has a great view of the bottom floor. Our last strategy uses Nox and CQC. Activate the fixed camera and equip the cardboard box to avoid being seen by guard C. Use the drop catch method to make your way to the bottom floor. Food will distract guard A, so no worries there. Press against this wall and knock three times to lure guard B into a run. Now throw a magazine clip due west. CQC takes care of guard D, and then flip into guard C. Guard B will run long ways around the bottom crates, so use this chance for an exit. Again, there's a lot to talk about here, so let's watch another execution of the knock and CQC strategy. The fixed camera helps to calibrate Snake's movements with the cardinal directions. Aligning him with these cardinal directions will make the drop and catch method, as well as throwing the empty clip more precise. Always keep the crates between Snake and Guard B. So roll instead of using CQC. This setup also illustrates guard awareness and priorities. The guard running after food would not respond to Nox because he's focused on a specific object. Guard B, however, has no priority focus. He is within range, despite being on a different elevation, so he responds exclusively to the Nox. Guard D pays attention to the sound of the empty clip. However, the empty clip is a lower priority focus than Snake's footsteps. For Guard B, the knocks are higher priority than sounds of combat, such as Snake's rolling KO. However, the unconscious Guard D is a higher priority than looking for the source of the knocks. Now this next area is a freebie. It starts with a call from Eva about the end, so be sure to skip that conversation. We'll use this as an opportunity to illustrate one of the properties of the cardboard box. When Snake wears the cardboard box, he runs at a fixed speed with no regard to terrain. Snake normally enters a slower animation on stairs and other steep grades, but wearing the box cancels that effect. We'll exploit this in the areas just ahead. Svatogorny West can disorient you easily, so let's build our map deliberately. The first of three possible paths runs right to the east. Our first stop occurs at the far east of the southern path. To the north, you'll find a grassy corridor with outlets to the west and north. Right now, we'll go north. On the map, you'll see that Snake has just passed a crawl space to the west. We'll revisit this soon. Run north, taking care to avoid the leaf pit trap on the right. Following the east wall, you'll stop at this location. Next, you'll use the terrain to Snake's advantage. Jump the nearby patrol from behind the rotting stump. Further ahead is a bottleneck where all paths ultimately lead. We'll stop here and restart to show other possible routes. Let's return to that crawl space we passed earlier. As before, run along the southern lateral path. When you're in the tall grass corridor under a hornet's nest, turn west. You'll see the opening in the map's borders that indicate the presence of another path. This crawl space will take you around the guard that we KO'd earlier. Now, Snake's movements can be disorienting in first-person intrusion view, so be sure to hug the right wall. If you've done it correctly, you'll emerge into open air facing north. The guard that we KO'd earlier patrols to the right, but he won't see Snake in this location if you've run directly here. You'll find a hollow trunk to Snake's left. Crawl through this trunk to avoid detection. Once you're through the log, stand up and run directly north and to the right. Here you'll reach the bottleneck that I mentioned earlier. We have one more possible route to explore, so now let's reset and begin again. We'll conclude the pre-bottleneck part of this map by exploring the gap directly to Snake's north. 
There's a lot of debris between Snake's starting location and the nearest checkpoint. Run as straight as possible without getting lost to arrive at this tree with climbing vines. Here, the land dips into a gutter corridor with one patrol. We can use a few familiar tricks here. First, run right around the fallen log, also avoiding another leaf pit trap. Draw the guard's attention with a low camo index. Then, run right back around the pit trap and enter the fallen log. Snake's camo index is high inside the log, so use this position to shoot the guard with a Mark 22. Full run of the corridor is now yours. The difference in elevation will mean that the guard to the right will not detect Snake as he moves north. He'll also be looking away as you follow the north wall to the bottleneck. You should have no trouble making it here undetected. Now, this strategy isn't useful if you're out of ammo or playing an all-CQC run, so let's use another familiar trick here instead. Crouch at the mouth of this corridor to keep the camo index low, equip an empty clip, and pitch it. There's quite a bit of ground to cover, so get moving as soon as you see the guard's white exclamation point. This, again, will bring you to the bottleneck undetected, and it will also shave off a few seconds of time. Now we're ready to tackle the bottleneck proper. However you've approached, there's a guard on the far end. Use an empty clip to turn him facing the north wall, and you can take him easily. Now the bottleneck ground has birds that fly off and catch the guard's attention when Snake runs through. If the guard turns, pull out your M1911, shoot him a few times, and then take him with CQC. After the bottleneck, run north toward this elevation. If you've timed everything correctly, the guard will have his back turned to Snake. Once he's down, run an arc to the left to catch the second guard's back. Now, if you're not confident that you've moved through the game fast enough for a Foxhound rank, I recommend moving north to fight the end immediately. If, however, you've got a few minutes, you might consider a detour through Svatogorny East. This area has the M63 machine gun, which I prefer to use during the first Shagohod chase sequence later in the game. Now to make this interesting, we'll strategize with the little used feature of the Payne's special camo, the ability to command hornets. We'll start by running east toward the nest on this tree. Once shot, the nest will drop and the hornets will cloud around Snake. Run north along this wall so Snake can climb these vines to the elevated path behind these soldiers. Hornets attack soldiers when they come near Snake. Any soldier that an afflicted guard encounters as he runs away will also flee the swarm. These guards have taken our first swarm, so we'll restock with a nest further down the path. Hornets leave Snake only when enemies are near, but they'll approach Snake from anywhere on the map while he's wearing the Hornet camo. Now we'll use a low camo index to attract this guard. Then we'll run north to emerge onto the roof of the food shed. Just to be obnoxious, let's plant a TNT charge inside the food shed, then run into the nearby tall grass. Another guard who patrols the building will see Snake and come to investigate. No one here after all. Lying in the grass, Snake remains hidden until the guard comes within Hornet range. As before, the Hornets clear out any guards in their way. Now, we're out of Hornets now, so we'll have to handle the remaining guards with Nox and CQC. As a side note, this area formerly served as a heavy load time playable level in the first Metal Gear Online released with Metal Gear Solid 3 subsistence. As such, it's one of the more open playground areas of Metal Gear Solid 3. This is not the only way through it. There are now zero guards in this area. 
There's our M63, and Snake is free to restock ammo for the fight against the end ahead. He can also restock TNT, using the opportunity to destroy the food shed as well. Guards chased off by Hornets will return to the map eventually. If Snake still wears the Hornet camo, so will the swarms that he used to chase off the guards. As noted before, the Hornets will find Snake anywhere on the map. This is a distant echo of the Pain's ability to locate enemies using Hornets. When enemies return to the map, the Hornets return to Snake, effectively alerting him that his enemies are about to become threats once more. Note the use of the cardboard box to cancel out the running animation on the hill. The Hornets arrive back on the map roughly 15 seconds before any guards return. Again, to be obnoxious, we'll wait around this corner as the guards come back. Huh? Someone there? Wait for it. Keep waiting. We now have five soldiers fleeing this level, hounded by hornets. If this isn't satisfying, I don't know what's wrong with you. Now, if you actually took that detection-free detour through Spadogorny East, you'll want to change back into Tiger Stripe Camo immediately. All the guards that you KO'd before are back awake, but this should prove no problem. Hold to the right wall and run north non-stop. You will finally enter the domain of the end. Not everyone wants to risk an entire area for the slim gains of the M63. So let's take one final look at Spadogorny West using the Hornet camo trick we just explored. First, we'll run along the lateral southern path. Once we reach the grassy intersection with the crawl space, we'll change into the Hornet Stripe Camo. Let's load up on Hornets. And then hide behind this stump. The Hornets will run this guard off, giving us free passage to the bottleneck. We no longer need Hornets, so we'll change back into Tiger Stripe Camo. Then we'll bother these birds, delay this guard with the M1911, and knock him out. Now we'll run straight to the knoll and take this guard from behind. And then we'll run an arc behind this final guard. Now let's head north to our final segment in this Foxhound Rank video walkthrough, the fight against the end. We'll start with the shortest strategy against the end, though it will use one of your limited saves. After the cutscene and codec conversation with Eva, immediately save your game. If you're playing on PS3, hit the PS button in the center of your controller to bring up the XMB. Exit the game. Now open up your PS3's time and date settings. Change the time forward one year. Wow! I recorded this all the way back on December 22nd! Don't forget to save the new date. Then fire up your Metal Gear Solid HD Collection disc. Load up MGS3. Load the game file that you just saved at the start of the fight against the end. And the fight is already over. Drop your weapon! What the hell happened? Maybe it was from old age. You mean he kicked the bucket in the middle of a battle? This strategy makes the fight exactly 8 seconds long, though you do miss out on the Mosin Nagant Tranquilizer Rifle. It's a clever trick, but it does have consequences. Now let's dig in. 
First, we'll cover strategies for hunting down the end and applying pressure to him once he's been discovered. We'll also examine how to interact best with environmental features such as running water, rain, and tiered cliffs. Snake's inventory can vary at start, but you definitely want to include the directional microphone, a smoke grenade, a stun grenade, the Mark 22, and the M63, though the AK is a working substitute. You also want your cardboard box, thermal goggles, and binoculars. Your first stop is the ammo shed to the northwest. Equip the smoke grenades, then orient Snake with a fixed camera so that he's running northwest. Once you can see the shed through this patch of trees, throw a smoke grenade in first person view. The end always starts on the cliffs right behind the ammo shed, and the smoke grenade enables Snake to move through here unseen. Enter the shed, and fill up on ammo. Once you're done, leave so that the door swings fully outward. The directional mic alerts us to the end's breathing on the cliffs behind the shed. The end is located at an awkward angle, but you can detect a slight heat signature using the thermal goggles. Now attract the end's attention. You can use the shed's door as a shield. Lean in first-person view from behind the door and fire in between the end's shots. Hit the end three times. And then run directly north as the end recovers from your attack. Equip the microphone to verify the end's retreat. And continue onward. To use the door as a shield, Snake must be standing just south of its edge. It's easy to get stuck inside the door, and from this position Snake cannot lean to fire at the end. Use the space between shots as an opportunity to reposition. Notice here that Snake stalks back behind cover for a better spot. And don't be disappointed if this takes some practice. You can use the fake death pill to continue without reloading your save if you need to practice. Here's another trick to divert the end's attention if you don't like using the door as a shield. Run to the left of the shack to pull the end's sights slightly away from the shed's east end. And then return to your attacking position near the door. Note here that the end will continue firing at a regular rhythm where he last saw Snake. This is a great place to listen so you get a feeling for that rhythm. To practice, test fire into the grass. Firing near blind is a valuable skill here and otherwise during this fight. And if you don't like that method, you can also hit the end with a stun grenade. Once again, the east edge of the shed is our best place for an opening attack. Catch his attention to trigger the regular rhythm of his shots, and throw it on the cliff where the end is positioned. Only move forward once you hear the end lament his blindness. Unlike the Mark 22, a stun grenade will not necessarily flush the end out of his position. As well, it does less damage than the Mark 22 unless you have a chance for a follow-up attack. From his starting position, the end will run into either the north or west areas. In this instance, the end has run west, whereas Snake has run north. We'll use this to illustrate how to judge when to move stealthily. Sweep the area in an arc with the microphone. The northern area lacks audio distractions, so you will hear the sound of the end if he's here. You can usually conclude that the end is absent after about 5 to 10 seconds. Once you've decided that the end isn't here, use the cardboard box. As noted before, the box cancels Snake's climbing animation, and it's invaluable for speeding up this fight. Now again, we know that the end started on an elevation and that he moved west, not north, after Snake's attack, or he stayed in the same place. First, we'll try Sokoviano West. Always use the mic in a new area. The end always starts pointing away from an area's perimeter. Approaching from the correct exit will give you the drop on him every time. Thermal goggles will locate the end best when you're nearby. Toggle them on and off if you need to conserve battery energy. Now our priority here is to grab the end's custom camo. Other bosses grant Snake their camo patterns after non-lethal victories, but we need to hold up the end to get his. Use the D-pad to stalk as you approach. He'll hear you otherwise. Once you're behind him, raise your gun and he'll lay down on the ground. He won't give up the camo unless you threaten him three times. I don't think so. 
You can threaten the N by waving the gun's iron sights back and forth over his head. You can attack him as soon as he drops the Moss Camo. The Moss Camo has two significant attributes. First off, in forest environments, the Moss Camo will give Snake a 95% Camo Index. Add the right face paint and it'll have a Camo Index of 100%. A lot of people have trouble here, so let's look at the hold-up one more time. I don't think so. First, sneak up and hold up the end. I don't think so. Wave the gun back and forth over his head. Uh, then, grab the camo. Fine. Next, let's look at the Moss Camo's second special quality. The Moss Camo will photosynthesize in direct light. This helps with a no-meal playthrough. Change into the Moss Camo as soon as you get it. The end throws a stun grenade to escape Snake after getting caught. Use the cardboard box to minimize the effects of his stun grenade, and as long as you know where he's running, you can use the cardboard box to increase the speed of your pursuit. Alternatively, if you need a break from the end, use the cardboard box to cover as much ground as possible before he locates another sniping spot. Snake is safe from attack as long as the end is running away. Now because Snake's stomach will growl and compromise this stealth battle, we want to recharge his stamina. As I said before, the Moss Camo will recharge Snake's stamina when Snake is standing in direct light. You might think intuitively that the diagonal rays of sunlight that connect the forest floor with the canopy would indicate locations where the sunlight is strong enough to recharge Snake's stamina. This unfortunately is not true. I prefer this location on the west side of the northern map to recharge Snake's stamina for a couple of reasons. First, if the end has taken residence in a western sniping spot, he'll have his back to Snake. Second, if the end is to the north or to the east, the slope's cliff debris blocks his view of Snake's location. The Moss Camo is great here for maintaining stamina levels once you've replenished the stamina bar, because you'll often be going in and out of sunlight patches. A full replenishing will cost time, though. I've timed how long it takes to replenish the entire stamina bar from zero, and you'll have a maximum wait of about two minutes. Obviously, this time will decrease the more stamina you already have at the start of your recharge. Once Snake's stamina has returned and turned off the sudden growls, we can again look for the end. Fortunately, we began recharging right behind his location. Attack the end from an intersection that'll have to run through when he's running away. This will help us chase the end after he's thrown his stun grenade. Don't forget your cardboard box. The end has invincibility after he throws his own stun grenade, so be sure not to attack him too soon when he starts running. Now, if the end is getting too far ahead, and if you have a smoke or stun grenade, you can throw it in his general direction. He'll take three hits from the Mark 22 once he's immobilized. As he recovers, he'll throw another stun grenade and become invincible once more. I want to point out again that here we know where the end is running and he's running uphill. His speed will remain the same no matter what terrain he covers, so we need to even up the odds by equipping the cardboard box for a stable running speed ourselves. The cardboard box drops Snake's camo index into the red in almost any terrain during this fight, if the end stops running, quickly lose the box and immediately lie prone. Bear in mind that even this won't guarantee a low enough camo index. The end thrives on distance. His strength is sniping, so you want to fight him close quarters as much as possible. Roll and tackle him as he's running away to keep a better track of him. The end has fixed starting directions whenever he arrives at a new sniping location. Again, these almost always point toward the center of the area. Track him on the perimeter to catch his back. Freeze. During this fight, the end's attacks resemble snakes with the Mark 22. Whenever Snake fires a Mark 22 dart into an enemy, the chemical starts a countdown. At the end of that countdown, the target will fall unconscious. Here, Snake will gradually lose stamina as well once hit by the end. Uniquely, the screen's perimeter will dim to alert us to the stamina drain. 
Bear in mind that removing the dart counts as a surgery and will contribute to the total number of serious injuries incurred during the game. Now, on another point, insofar as the cardboard box is a great tool for traveling quickly to another area or for pursuing the end, its low camo index almost universally compromises your location. Before we add anything else to these strategies, let's look at how they operate in unison during a chase. First, we locate the end and confirm his presence with the thermal goggles. Then, we attack him from an intersection that he must escape through. Put on the cardboard box to nullify the stun grenade, and then immediately pursue the end. Tackle him with a roll, and then chase him back up the hill, again using the cardboard box to even the speed of the pursuit. Now re-equip the thermal goggles to confirm the end's location by observing his footprints. Since the end has arrived at a new spot, lose the cardboard box and go prone to avoid detection. Flash the goggles on and off while confirming his presence to save battery power. And attack! The end flees the area, and Snake maintains the chase. When chasing the end into a new area, Snake will arrive after the end has already reached a new sniping location. In other words, the chase ends and the hunt begins again, except we have a better idea of where to look for the end. Note that the end has his back to the entrance. Now we repeat the same techniques. Confirm his location. Attack. and then use the cardboard box for pursuit. Show must go on. Again, we'll use the thermal goggles to confirm the end's destination. Rain washes away his boot prints, so we want to resume scouting with a microphone before we lose his trail. The rest is largely a matter of repetition. Since we can no longer confirm the end's location as certainly as before, we want to use as many tools as possible to minimize error. Walking into the wrong location can make Snake an easy target. The end thrives on games of hide-and-seek, so the best strategy is to play another game entirely. Tag. You're it. Different terrains will alter the execution of these strategies, so let's try chasing the end in the opposite direction. Here, we've just held up the end to acquire the moss camo, and the end flees northwards. If you need assurance that you're following the correct path, I advise flashing the thermal goggles on and off so that you can steer Snake better. Since we're entering a new area entirely, the end will have already set up shop nearby, and if he's near, he'll be facing away from the site of Snake's entrance. A quick flash of the thermal goggles confirms his location. Holding up the end can have further use if you got the knockout cigarettes from Grannon's lab. Hold him up, go into first person view, and blow smoke right on top of him. The burst of gas registers as two hits, and they drain more stamina than normal Mark 22 shots. A third hit does less damage. Now back to the intersection with the box. And we tackle the end as he runs past Snake. We can try our luck hitting the end with first-person gunshots. And just because it doesn't work is no reason not to try. And now we're using the box to chase the end uphill. We didn't lose the box fast enough, so the end is located Snake. However, we can use the terrain to our advantage, placing the trees between the end's rifle and Snake. But watch out for the goat. Suffice to say, the end is much harder to approach when he's already seen you. The end throws a grenade since Snake is nearby, but we can still shoot him with the Mark 22 as he flees. I almost can't believe that worked. Again, we see where he's going, so the cardboard box evens up our pace. 
this eastern ridge that runs north and south along this level is pretty hilly, so the cardboard box will definitely help you here. The end will stop running when he runs out of breath. Use this opportunity to hit him with a grenade if he's positioned beyond the level's boundaries. But use something better than a smoke grenade. Quick confirmation with the thermal goggles shows his location. This entrance to the southern area has only one exit, so sometimes the end will start off facing Snake rather than the other way around. Given the difficulty of approaching the end when he knows where Snake is, we definitely want to confirm where he's facing. And we can use the binoculars to confirm the direction that he's facing. Approach silently by stalking with the D-pad. Sometimes this can take a while. Hold him up. And then hit him with the Mark 22 or the knockout gas. Then intercept his escape with a tackle. Follow up the tackle with either the cigarettes or the Mark 22. Here we find that the end is already trucked halfway across the level. Pursuing him now would likely result in detection and injury, so we want to circle around his location. Now we'll put the chase on pause and take a moment to observe the properties of cliffs in this area. There are several points during this battle where you'll find Snake running along a cliff's edge. Falling off a cliff can result in a serious injury, and this, of course, can count against your Foxhound rank. Here we have a cliff with two tiers. Intuition suggests that grabbing the edge of the top tier and dropping down rather than outright falling off will save Snake an injury. This is plainly not true. Falling from most heights uninterrupted, even with the deliberation of dropping from a ledge, will result in serious injury. To prevent serious injury, you need to interrupt Snake's fall by catching the second tier ledge. This ledge is not a space where Snake can stand, and it exists solely to soften the fall. Why this does not pull Snake's shoulder out of joint is a mystery. Now he has landed safely aground. Using the cardboard box near cliffs is extremely risky. If Snake walks off a ledge while wearing the cardboard box, he will fall straight down without automatically turning to catch the first tier ledge. If you're fast, you can still catch the second tier ledge to prevent serious injury. And, of course, if you don't grab the second tier ledge, Snake will incur a serious injury. This must be extremely embarrassing. Bear in mind that not all high cliffs feature second tier ledges for Snake to grab on his way down. Some mistakes with a cardboard box are simply irredeemable. As noted before, you might intuit that deliberately dropping off a cliff will save Snake a serious injury. Snake's turn and grab is not a bid for permission to fall unharmed. It's a second chance not to fall. Don't worry, everyone makes this mistake. If you're having trouble dealing with the end after detection, check out the survival viewer. The red circle on your map indicates the end's location. To prove the value of this, let's do that again in a harder setting. The NC Snake, and he can be hard to find here because the river interferes with the microphone. Furthermore, once you're discovered, using the microphone from a safe location involves greater risk because the end's location is unknown. Use the map to locate the end and break his line of sight. The end has keener hearing than an average guard. 
If you walk too heavily while approaching his location, he will turn to face Snake's direction even if the terrain breaks his line of sight. Don't try to sneak past when he's this close. Instead, flush him out with either a stun or smoke grenade. Snake's grenade will stall his run, so you have enough time to hit him with your weapon of choice. Remember though that Snake will cough if he inhales smoke. Next we'll focus on ways to stall the end's escape using lethal weapons. Traps such as Claymore landmines can be strategic risks. Don't lay them unless you're confident that the end will run through the spot where you place the mines. Here we see the end on a cliff with two exits. We have a 50-50 chance that he'll escape through this exit in particular. The idea here is similar to fighting Running Man in Metal Gear 2, whose path Solid Snake had to mine for victory. If you've covered enough ground to flesh out your map, use the map to determine which exits to mine. Here we'll mine the northern route and stand guard over the southern exit. If he goes north, he'll hit the mines. If he goes south, Snake can tackle him. Wherever he goes and however he falls, Snake can follow up then with the Mark 22. Place your claymores so the trigger ranges cover the entirety of a choke point. Stagger their placement so you don't set them off yourself. Notice the two letter C icons on the map. These mark where Snake has set claymore mines. If you'll recall, the strategy calls for guarding the southern route, but we're going to stay north here for the purpose of illustration. The end's period of invincibility after attack can overlap with his running over the mines. Here we've caught the closing of that window, so place them just further away from him than we've placed these. Landmines disappear from a level when you leave and return, so don't worry about accidentally blowing yourself up with forgotten mines if you return after following him to another area. We'll come back to tricks for using lethal weapons to slow the end's escape in a moment. Notice now that rain has begun falling right when the end transitions from one load area to another. Rain removes the end's boot prints more quickly, rendering the thermal goggles useless for tracking him to his new location. When you can't locate the end's immediate path of escape visually, stop, crouch, and pull up your directional microphone. The end's breathing will be distorted by the sound of the rain, so picking a direction to investigate requires a combination of confident decision-making and guesswork. Now listen close to when we find the end's breathing. His breathing sounds like it's coming from this direction, so we'll check the map to see what sniping spots are nearby. We don't have much to go on here, but we do know that he's somewhere east. And that is a definite lead. First we'll check out the spots nearest by. We see that he's not here, so if we've concluded correctly, he must be further east in this area. Even though rain will increase Snake's general camo index, approaching the end from the front is always risky on European Extreme. So we need to strategize. Let's flank his position by taking a detour through the southern area. If this were a real area with real spaces unbroken by level boundaries, snakes running 100 yards south would not necessarily render him safe from detection. However, we can take advantage of the particular way that space and character perception function in this video game by ducking into the southern load area. The end will not see snake anywhere in an area adjacent to the end's location. Now that we've re-entered the northern load area, we'll use the directional microphone to see if he's on the eastern cliff to our right or elsewhere to the north. We've heard his breath, so now let's see which direction Snake is facing. By referring to the map, we see that he is, in fact, somewhere north. The center of the northern load area is a valley populated with trees and some terrain debris. This creates a deceptive sense of cover. Each of the end's preferred sniping spots gives him a clear view of at least one visual corridor running through these obstacles. Also remember that the end almost always faces the center of the map by default. If Snake moves directly through the center of the map while the end is here, the likelihood of detection increases. 
be careful using binoculars if you're anywhere near the center of one of these load areas. The end will spot snake from glare off the lenses. Now let's get back to lethal weapons. The lethal and non-lethal categories of firearms have distinct properties. Non-lethal firearms, such as the Mark 22 or the Mosin Nagant rifle, have higher skill demands. First, enemies will turn to face the direction of Snake's attack if the first shot is anything other than a headshot. Second, enemies will not stagger when hit as they will when shot by a lethal weapon. Third, Snake must manually cycle the empty casing from the firearm in order to ready the next round. Properties exclusive to lethal firearms, such as the M1911 handgun, the AK assault rifle, and the M63 machine gun can imply lower skill demands. The trick here is to use these properties strategically. First, any attack other than a headshot will stagger an enemy. This stagger period lasts about one second, during which enemies will not perceive Snake, though they will face Snake's direction once they recover. Second, Snake can follow a lethal firearm attack with another immediately, resetting the enemy's stagger time frame. As we've seen before, we can use these properties of the M1911 handgun to stall enemies while covering distance to hit them with non-lethal CQC. Automatic weapons become invaluable during the fight against the end for their second exclusive property, the ability to attack without interruption. Remember, a Foxhound rank requires that you accrue no kills. Any damage with a lethal weapon short of fatal force is acceptable. When the end reaches the last quarter of his stamina bar, he will ask the forest to grant him strength. Listen to this. He does this only once during a fight, but he will magically heal his stamina bar to full. This is unacceptable during a time-sensitive Foxhound rank playthrough. Simply locating the end in this instance can prove difficult. A bright light above him can serve as a beacon to his location, but this beacon is general at best. The end will not see Snake approach while healing, so you have at least that much freedom to find and interrupt him. Any attack will interrupt the end's healing technique. However, slower attacks, such as grenades, precision aiming through dense cover with a Mark 22, and physically assaulting the end can take too long. If the end has healed past the halfway mark of his stamina bar, I recommend resetting the fight in the interest of your rank's final time. Again, we need to strategize. Capture the end's parrot in preparation. In the western load area, stand at this location on the map. On European Extreme, you'll find the parrot in this nook of this tree. Finding the bird will take some practice. He blends in with the leaves, so give yourself time to find him if you've never done this before. Shoot the bird with the Mark 22 and capture it alive. Next, open your survival viewer. Select the parrot's cage as an item from Snake's weapon inventory. When Snake throws the parrot, she will fly directly to the end. This is the fastest way to locate him when he starts healing. I can't stress this enough, but save the parrot for the end's healing technique. If you're stuck locating him under normal circumstances, practice the techniques explained in this video. Nobody wants to nearly defeat the end and lose it because of this. Right now, we know the end's general location from the previous attempt. When the end gets this low on stamina, it's a good idea anyway to use the microphone more often to listen for his telegraph. As soon as you hear the end groan, ready the parrot. And throw it like any other food item. Equip your thermal goggles. The bird's heat signature appears after the cage hits the ground. The column of light that appears above the end during this action can be unhelpful because of how bright these areas are generally. If you lose the parrot's heat signature in the column of light, don't worry. Now at least you still know which direction to run in. And now he hasn't healed too much. Good enough. Hit him with a Mark 22 and you're safe from this happening again. And now we reach my favorite part. Chasing the end with the M63 and screaming. Remember the two key qualities of lethal weapons. Their ability to stagger enemies and their uninterrupted rate of fire. Hitting the end with any gun will make him pause his sprint, but the Mark 22 doesn't auto-aim well in these circumstances, and the end is a hard target to hit in first-person view. The M63's defining trait is its 100-round belt-fed hail of bullets. This gives you a huge window of time to attack continuously. You can start firing before the end's invincibility period ends, and the bullets will catch him as soon as he's vulnerable. 
His side-to-side -side movements give the Mark 22's discreet shots trouble, but the wide spray of an unstable machine gun can accommodate for that. The end will fall and enter his invincibility time frame after he's hit three times. If you simply want to catch up to him, knock him down to make up for lost distance. If you want to whittle away the stamina that he regained while healing, space out his stagger animations so that you can hit him with a roll or a non-lethal weapon on the second or third hits. A lesser use of the M63 is as a blunt object. You almost always have better tools for close quarters attacks. There's also a lot less screaming. Now let's return to the end's healing technique. Here we've thrown the parrot so we can follow it to the end. Again, any attack interrupts his healing. As long as you don't go too far and register a kill, you're fine for the purposes of a foxhound rank. Now the end has already healed quite a bit, so we'll pull out the M63 and let loose in first person view. The video for the next several minutes will show you where to find the parrot on European Extreme in both the southern and northern load areas. The content of these clips is self-evident, so I'm going to digress and tell you why the fight against the end is my favorite in Metal Gear Solid 3. Fair warning, this is a pretty detailed opinion. The battle against the end is an archetypal rite of passage in nature's proving grounds against a patriarchal figure, a kind of green man representing the quality of cyclical, seasonal regeneration echoed across culture and history in such forms as the second titular character in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and even the slaughtered harvest gods detailed in Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough. By battling Snake non-lethally, the figure of the end is a kind of playful nature spirit similar to dryads and even conglomerate forest bandit figures such as Robin Hood. This fight also indicates the generational transmission of power, and it conveys affection through combat typical of enemies in the Metal Gear series. It's one of the highlights of MGS3 for reasons that the more they're explored, encompass gameplay, storytelling, flexible problem solving, directorial presentation, and even reaching the quick of archetypes that gives the Metal Gear saga its gravitas. The M63 as a weapon of choice is excellent in particular because it takes that textured concept, crushes it, and changes the scenario into a seasoned professional soldier still in his physical prime, using a high-powered machine gun to chase down a nonagenarian without armor and without a single lethal weapon on his body in the middle of a magic forest. Whether you want this fight to serve as a resonator of archetype and reinforcer of thematic concern, or as Snake chasing an old man through the woods while screaming, MGS3 lets you have your fill. And in the event that the thematic dissection of this boss fight comes off as pretentious and overwrought, consider two counter-arguments. One, I don't care. Two, I'm probably right. Back to the game. We'll show how to find the parrot in the south load area one more time before we're done, so let's give its location in the north special attention. Start at the southeast entrance. The end won't always be on this cliff, but we're pinpointing this location since he's exactly where Snake should be for finding the parrot. The parrot acts as the end spotter, though here the end can see Snake as well. Toss a smoke grenade, and then put on your cardboard box. Then head uphill before the smoke dissipates. This will let you pass and keep Snake safely out of sight. Now we'll circle around the end, pull out the Mark 22, and flush him on out. Now we settle at a choke point and catch the end as he runs away. Now instead of following up with a chase this time, we're going to show where to position Snake to locate the parrot. Crawl into the ferns on the far right of this cliff. You want Snake pointing northwest on the far right sniping spot on the map. Unlike the other load areas, the thermal goggles are great for locating the parrot here. Snake will automatically go into first person view when you're lying prone in tall grass. Center the parrot in your binoculars, and he'll still be centered when you unequip. And then the parrot goes to sleep. 
Remember that the end in this area has a great view of the valley as well as the slope where the parrot fell. Jumping for the parrot straight off carries some risk. So collect the bird carefully. We'll close our treatment of the end with an unbroken, unedited playthrough of this fight. You'll observe that not all strategies detailed thus far are used. The content of this video is designed so that you can pick and choose the way you want to approach this fight. This playthrough is one possible combination of those tools. That notwithstanding, I always start by heading to the shed as discussed before. I'll use my smoke grenade and box to make it there undetected. Now to load up on ammo, and use the door as a shield for chasing off the end. He's already seen me here, so there's really no use in using a silencer. Here I'm feeling out his location. And got him. Now I could run up the slope to get the end's parrot, but I'd rather hurry this along, so I'm just going to grab it out of the northern load area. To do this, I'm going to take this area's northeast exit. And now check out the cliff with the microphone. Now he's up there, so I'm going to throw a smoke grenade down here. And I'll use the cardboard box to move up this hill more quickly. Since I know where the end is and which direction he's facing, this is a great chance to get the moss camo. Sneak up on him by stalking with the D-pad. Where did you... And now I'll do myself a favor for the rest of the fight and shake him down for the moss camo. I don't think so. One. I don't think so. Two. Uh, and there he drops it. Here, take it and go. I'll use the cigarettes up close. This will save my Mark 22 ammo for future distance attacks. Here I roll before his invincibility window ends. So instead of letting the end get away too easily, I will be a horrible human being and gun down the magic grandfather as he flees. Now I've lost enough time and distance with that second failed roll to make it worth my while to turn around and grab the parrot. He will be looking for me soon though, so I'll put on the moss camo. Back on the cliff, I'll locate Snake in the ferns we pointed out before so I can capture the bird. I want, I want this, this shot, shot to, be to be quiet. quiet. And since I know where the bird is, there's no need for the scope. I want to scan the area first before recklessly running after the bird. I hear the end, but he's all the way on the cliff on the other side of the map. This increases the odds that a calculated risk will turn out well. The end's breath seems now to be coming faintly from the north. I figure either the end changed locations while I was going after the bird, or I was actually wrong. That might have been a more dangerous risk than I thought. I know that the area to the northeast of this map is sheltered, so I'm going to keep crawling to maintain a low camo index until I get there. Wherever he was when I went for the bird, his location definitely now seems to be north-central. Admittedly, this is a half-guess but I am going to have to trust my gut and assume that I've now broken his line of sight. And I'll go ahead and put on the cardboard box to make this quicker. 
It brings my camo index dangerously low, yes, but he'd have shot me for standing up if he could see me at all. I very much need to recharge Snake's stamina, so it's worth the while to stand here and soak up the sunlight. Just enough to stop his stomach from growling is good. I'm feeling impatient and want to hurry this up. This is the He's pretty close by. A lot closer by than I thought. So it's time to use terrain as a shield. The audio cues are way too vague and I'm not picking up anything on the thermal goggles. I need to know what I'm dealing with, so I'll go to the map and find his location there. This is still vague in the field of play. Since I know he has to cycle around in the chamber after firing, I make a break for new cover after he fires. With a 100% camo index, I can afford to use the directional microphone without fear of being caught. Using the scope would be a bad idea. Referring again to the map is a low-risk tool. The ground changes color and texture here. As a result, my fast-moving camo index drops from 95 to 75. This is too low of a camo index for the risk. To continue proceeding carefully, I'll use the D-pad to stalk crawl while using the thermal goggles. And that goat is hiding an old man. We're closer, so the risk is greater. Time to use the map to be extra sure. The goat will always see you no matter your camo index. The goat will always kick you no matter your camo index. So I'm gonna lay this goat to sleep. And this guy too! And that's how you sneak up on the end from the front. There's nothing else to do but chase him now. I messed up my chance to do stamina damage, but I have slowed him down, so I can keep better track of where he's going. There's no risk with a low camo index while he's running away, so I'll use my cardboard box to maintain the gain I have on his lead. If I hadn't knocked him down with the M63, I wouldn't have seen him go directly into this area. This saves time looking for him, and it speeds up the pace of this fight. Again, I want to save my Mark 22 ammo for situations such as when I needed to shoot him from afar. So I'm going to use my cigarettes up close. This kind of reminds me of an old Tom and Jerry cartoon. It started to rain and he already blends in pretty well with the background. I want to use the M63 to slow him down and the blood that spurts out when I hit him helps to mark him in my sight. Now tap it. And we get that bit of stamina damage. The end does have a limited life bar, so I only want to use the M63 when I think I've got a good chance of slowing him down. I don't know why I keep trying that. Anyway, this time I'll just use the cardboard box. I have chased the end off the map, but when he stopped, he's run out of breath. This still registers as being in this load area. I can't follow up, but the stun grenade does do some stamina damage. The thermal goggles don't work as well during the mist after the rain. Here I accidentally drew the end's attention by having a low camo index and peeking up over this ridge. There's no real good way to get at the end from this position.
I didn't miss deliberately, of course, but by firing and missing, I have driven him off to a new spot. By ending the standoff and forcing him back into a chase, I've sped up the pace of this fight. We're in a new area, and we don't really know where the end has set up shop. As before, the thermal goggles and the microphone are ideal tools to orient Snake to his location. He looks like he's facing away, so I'm going to trust the odds and just approach him directly. And of course I'm going to stalk in order to prevent any unnecessary sound. Again with the cigarettes to save Mark 22 ammo. Snake's hunger is getting pretty low again, but I want to stay on the end's heels. It's risky, because if the end shoots me with a Mosin Nagant here, I'm almost certainly going to be knocked out from the shot. I do want to stay on top of him though, so I'm going to take that risk. Committing to that risk, I'm going to run forward and simply follow his footprints without regard to my camo index. Trusting to the end's normal habits, I'm going to look for him facing the center of the level. And there he is. Almost got the end down. When he's this low on health, I like to use any means necessary to get those final shots in. Realizing that he's about to roost in a new spot, I roll and go prone on the ground, bringing my camo index up to 100. Because the end is facing the center of the level, right now he has the advantage. When I find him this one last time, that'll be the match. There he is in the ferns on the right. Because the end is facing the center of the level, right now he has the advantage. This means I need to sneak up extra carefully. I could shoot the goat as I did last time, but that would risk drawing the end's attention right my way. As mentioned previously, as low as Snake's stamina is, the whole fight is at stake here. I really don't want to take that risk. And got him. We're moving quickly, so any time between 15 and 30 minutes is okay. And that brings us to the end of our long tour to and through the end. Thanks for watching what you have, and it might be a while, but I do look forward to seeing you next time. Take care of yourself, and have a good night.